next session is on the insurance company of the future, setting the agenda for talent, diversity, and inclusion. I'm very pleased indeed to be joined uh, by Ivy Kusinga, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Career Vines, by uh, Chen Foley, the uh, senior vice president of Arcadian, and by Ann Haw, who's the CEO of Access Re. Hi. We, we didn't get a chance to say a hi, so hi. Hello. Uh, <coughs> I should warn you that Ivy and I sat, sat next to each other at dinner last night and we solved all these problems already. Did not. But, <laughs> but I can't remember. There was a lot of nice white wine, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, let's start with, with just trying to get clear about what we're talking about here. I think when we talk about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, we, people mean a lot of different things. So especially in the context of this industry and this place, what are we talking about? Why are these issues important? I don't know if you want to start, Ivy? Or? Sure, I'll just jump in. So you know, it, it's, it's actually very striking to look at the composition of the room because this is a very diverse room, and Bermuda has such a richness of diversity. So why does this matter to the, the Bermuda market and the insurance industry? So I'll and just... you worked here for... You should, I, I did. Should. I lived here for 13 years, all right? So I think I have um, enough of a lens of what it means to live and work locally. But I would say that... The, so diversity, I, I think, is just the differences that we all have, intrinsic or extrinsic differences. And I think one of the things I'd like to tackle is even white men are diverse. I think one of the misnomers is white men are placed um, outside the context of diversity when in fact they are part of that diversity. But the implications on that difference varies depending on who you are. The inclusion matters because we need to see that diversity rising in organization. Equity, which I hope we'll touch on, is really about giving people the appropriate um, support that they need, giving them the, the visibility that they need. So you look at this room, but the optics of a senior management group in insurance or senior executive groups would be predominantly white. So equity is really something we have to tackle. And then lastly, I talk about belonging because especially after COVID, and I think in the prep discussion, we talked about hybrid, we know that the wellness issues, the mental, mental health issues are coming to bear. So uh, to me, belonging is about understanding that people have an irreducible need for care and connection. And so that becomes part of the dialogue for the talent play. You want to pick up on that thread, Anne? Or? Sure, sure. Um, I, I agree, obviously agree with what you said. I mean, to, I think it's about welcoming the diverse perspectives, different experiences, um, cultural, geographic, um, backgrounds um, into the workplace and into our industry. And it's also, though, about creating and instilling that culture that inspires that inclusivity um, where opinions are allowed to be voiced and heard. Um, and I think, you know, we've made some progress, but I would still say, and I hope we get to sort of what are our barriers, because I think part of our barriers are ourselves, continuing to hire people that look just like ourselves, or, you know, we reflect back on the tradition the traditional nature of our industry, and we love that richness and history of it. On the other hand, we can't, you know, you wouldn't have hired me probably 30 years ago to be an underwriter um, with what the skills are you need for today. And I think hopefully we can unpack that a little bit in terms of giving some, some of our advice, maybe what's worked or what's not, to progress, you know, the future of, of talent and the future of inclusivity in our industry. Yeah. So when I, I hear both Ivy and Ann, I, I, I'm living the experience right now because I joined a company 12 months ago. I'm building a, a claims team. And I think if you've tried to recruit in the last two to three years, you, you, you will have experienced the, 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 the war to attract talent, right? And so from my perspective, I want to be able to say that we have a company and I'm creating a team that's going to attract people. Um, we've taken the view that we're going we're gonna to bring in people um, with limited experience. And so we're going to go through the effort and the time of training them. And so I need to cast a wide net to not just get po folks in the door. I need to make sure the culture is such that we're keeping the talent that we have because of the expense in terms of time um, and, and financial expense in terms of, of, create, of, of, of bringing people into the, into the team. So I think I agree exactly with what you said. And that's just sort of the practical implications of that from my perspective. Yeah, I, I, wanna, I do want to focus a lot on recruiting talent here because 
anyone who's reasonably senior in any organization in this industry, in my industry, it's about how do you get the best people in the door. It's a brutal competition out there in, in, in the industry, across industries. So uh, what are the unmet need, needs in this industry and in Bermuda in terms of talent? And I'm talking about needs in terms of different backgrounds, in terms of diversity inclusion, in terms of skills. What, what are the gaps that need to be filled? I'll start, and I'm sure there's plenty of other uh, suggestions. I, I think, you know, part of it is knowledge transfer. If you think about it, we've got four generations, at least, in, in the workplace today. Um, and, you know, are we sharing that knowledge and expertise of years of experience because that's what's valued or has been valued in the past is years of experience versus skills and capabilities. So I would say we need to strike a better balance there. Um, in terms of that knowledge are transfer. You saying there's too many old people or too many young people? <laughs> the old people aren't transferring their knowledge to the young people. Right. There's, there's, I think it's almost, how would I describe it? They speak different languages, yeah. right? Like, I mean, I have two children in their early 20s, and the way in which they want to work, the way in which they feel included at work, the types of culture and environment they're looking for, um, the way in which they choose an employer is very different than perhaps what I would say the criteria are or were for me when I was starting my career many years ago. And so I think we have to be thinking about, not, uh, about how we attract those different needs and then how we support in the culture that the company has, that environment. Because ESG is on the top of their list. You know, do you have employee resource groups that might focus on their specific areas of need or interest? And you know, the other uh, unmet need I would say is we're not hiring for the future needs. We're just recycling talent and not thinking about the skills, so upskilling, and you know, really trying to bridge the gap between technology, technology. skills. Are you, are you really talking about tech, technology skills, risk modeling skills? What are the particular? Well, even, right. even hybrid working. Right. right. We're not all sitting next to each other like we might have in the past. How do you hold a meeting where you make people feel included when you've got three of them individually on a little box on the screen, and then you've got maybe 10 people in the room. The way in which you have to do that, the way in which you make people feel included and not you know, FOMO or not that they're not gonna get promoted because they're not in the office five days a week, those are real issues. And I think you know, as, as managers and leaders, that makes it, it much more critical to be focused on outcomes and not just Productivity. Pro productivity and outcomes, and not just I showed up, I, I my pass, I, you know, I, I checked <laughs> checked in today. The, the, in yeah, because, please. Um, I, I just I want to give a contrasted view because I don't think in Bermuda the issue necessarily is about attracting people into the insurance business. Certainly, it's a very small marketplace. They have very significant footprint on the economy, so. I hope, Chen, this is your reality, that people will be filling your inbox with, hey, I'm here, could you please hire me? I think part of my contrasted view for Bermuda is you get them in, but will they get the opportunity and the visibility yes. to grow appropriately and have that opportunity to the very top of these organizations? So Bermuda is actually a very highly educated population. Black women predominantly get uh, the highest uh, percentage of, of degrees, but black women actually fall very short. And these are statistics from ABIC. So Noelle Pierman, who is uh, kindly in the audience, you know, has put out really an interesting study where you see the statistics of black Bermudians in particular entering, but then they flatten out in the middle and they're non-existent at the senior level. Yes. So I accept Anne's point of view that we've got to do more to bring digital natives and kind of get skills transferred, but I really do think we also have to think about representation of talent all the way to the top. It is a vexing problem in my industry. The class of new recruits looks like the readers, looks like the country, uh, and something happens mid-career. That's, that's, not, that's not new, right? And so I yeah, think yeah. With, whether we talk about sort of, depending on whatever the demographic group, women, I mean, I, I started my career as a lawyer. They're 50-50 in terms of male and women in law school. By the time you get to the first year of law school, 50-50, at some point, 
it's just the men and, and at the senior levels making partner, whether it's salaried partner or equity, same with race, same with national, nationality, national background. I like the idea and I, I appreciate the, 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 the dimension of data. I think, I think we need to find ways to better consistently capture data um, to see and track performance and progression within the industry because I suspect when we see the, the, the numbers of women, black people, uh, LGBTQ people dropping off, it, that requires us to, I think, step back and inquire as to what yeah. the reason do, is, do right? Do we have a theory about what's happening? Uh, we've got theories. I think everyone's got a theory, right? Yeah. But the, the question is, do <laughs> we know theory what- theory and $20 we know what, gets you a movie ticket. Do we know what the reality is, yeah. right? And so f the yeah. theory for women is, um, women Family. generally caregivers, right? From an equity perspective, if we see that the number of women progressing in the organization is dropping off, equity says that we need to step back and, and, and reassess the situation and say, what is it that we can do to ensure that caregivers, not women, but caregivers can contribute positively to the organization, continue within the organization, that we capture the talent that we otherwise lose. I want to talk about mentoring here. I don't even know if that's the word I want, but Anne started with knowledge transfer. Like, are the senior people who re represent the historical memory and the skill base of the organization, are they pulling people along as they approach mid-career and pulling them through mid-career? Are we doing a good job at that? Do we know how to do that within our organizations? Uh, some better than others. Yes. Um, I don't, it doesn't always feel natural. Yes. I think, um, because where you are in your life and the way in which you're thinking about your priorities is very different than a young person. The other thing is a lot of people like to work differently. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, people, some people like the collaboration and the we environment and the sharing and working together. And that's, you know, then you've got others that are like to just do their work and their thing. So I think trying to find like style people to be able to share that knowledge I think is important, but it comes down to trust and respect. Yeah. And I think that really has to be the DNA and the culture of a company to sort of, because I think forcing, even when you say like a mentor and a mentee, it, there has to, it has to gel. It, you can't just stick two people together. And yeah, go, these programs tend to be kind of random, right? <clears throat> like here are the senior people, here are the junior people. Yeah. Okay, you guys talk amongst yourselves. And it doesn't, that doesn't seem to work. It's a, probably, an, I think what we're referring to here is an artificial way of sort of trying to replicate something that for some people happens naturally, but we recognize, particularly in the insurance industry, which is a people industry, that network matters, right? And so I look at the work that Acre is doing, the Association for Corporate Racial Equity in Bermuda, in terms of bringing folks together, underrepresented people together in an environment, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way to, to either meet new people, um, develop and foster new relationships with new people. The reality is in our industry, progress is often tied to who you know and what relationships you have. And I think, you know, so let's admit that there is something wired in our brains that uh, sort of keeps us comfortable with the people that we know. So I, I don't want to demonize, like, you know, white leaders in the insurance industries are probably more their inner circle is white because those are the people that they know, those are the people they care about. But when it comes to talent decisions and somebody who sat at the table, because those are closed door decisions, I would advocate for sponsorship far more than I would advocate for mentoring. Okay, tell because, me the difference between those two. Okay, what is so, the difference between a sponsor so, and a mentor? So mentoring is, I think what we all get is, you know, as Chen said, is somebody's talking to you about your career, there is professional guidance, and as Anne said, you know, so you can look up to somebody. Sponsorship is somebody who has influence and power and has a vested interest in making sure that your career moves. Mm -hmm. There is no way any of us got here without having one of those big heavies behind us. If any of you know Evan Greenberg personally, please send him an email right now or a text to say, Ivy is grateful. I would not have made it to the top levels of, of CHAMP without an Evan Greenberg behind me. Now, it's always a you know, circumstantial situation. You have to treat that very carefully, obviously. But I do think we've got to really start talking about sponsorship of talent, especially to get people out of mid-management ranks so that they can actually grow. But if we have a group, and I know I'm walking on uh, landmines, 
here, I'm trying not to step on them, but if you have a bunch of potential sponsors who come from a close-knit community and they are mostly male and they are mostly white, and you have a group of sponsees with that potential mm -hmm. uh, who don't look like that. That's right. We're trying to m make the, those connections. We're trying to play the dating game a little bit between those people. How, how do you do that without it being, art you use the word artificial. How do you make it organic and make it real? And I, so from my perspective, this comes back to sort of like the, 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 the theme of this panel, right? The role of DEI and DEI initiatives. And part of the role of DEI is to open our eyes to our blind spots, to, 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 to practices and behaviors that we have and that we exhibit, um, which are probably unintentional um, and, and meant in the best, with the best intent. Um, help us to, to reflect on the fact that business as usual is no longer business as usual. Um, and that if I'm at a table and everybody at the table is a black male lawyer, um, that may not be the best sort of I may want to extend my network if I want to attract talent to my team, to my company that will help the company progress, be profitable, and help us be productive. But there's, there's responsibility on both sides. So uh, the, 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 the leaders have a duty. Leaders want, you know, as a business, you have two levers, capital and people. You want people to rise. Any good leader who has really a commitment to these issues, wants people to do well. So as a leader, to Chen's point, you need to observe, do I have people around the table that can bring the best ideas? Is this a really good mix? Where are my blind spots? Where are we falling short, right? But then there's also responsibility on the talent because opportunities don't just come to you when you're sitting at your desk. I mean, you honestly have to push and you're pushing out of your area of comfort. So to be honest, Robert, it's not my cup of tea to be around white men all the time, but I was around oh, I'm white men. I'm shocked to hear that. <laughs> I, was, I was around white men all the time because I recognized that that was where the power was. Yeah. So if I wanted to get into helping my company in a way that was really meaningful, I needed to get past my discomfort. So I don't think it's a passive situation. Leaders have to push in, and the talent also has to push up. I'm, I'm really interested in hear, hearing from the rest of you about this. I think this is so important. The lesson that was always drilled into me, my, par my parents, was don't ask, don't get. Ask, ask, ask. Uh, and people who look like me have an easier time asking sometimes. I is that a skill that can be taught, right? T teaching the talent to push in the right way at the right time to ask. I think. It's about leading by example mm. and, and trying to, to draw that out. Because I think you're absolutely right. If I look back, you know, and you know, I don't want to call it playing the game, but you had to play along to be able to, you know, you weren't going to get invited to the lunch. You know, you kind of had to work your way in or whatever it was when it was all the, mm. you know, the white males. So, you know, as a woman coming up in this industry, I think I felt, you know, how do you balance one thing is never compromise your own values, but two, how do you be your own advocate, because I think I very much agree it's a two-way street. You can't sit and wait for someone to help you, you, know, you develop yourself or your career. But I think your network becomes incredibly important. Um, you know, and we probably have some recruiters in the room, and I apologize, but I do think many people get their next role or get moved around in companies because of who they know, you know or the visibility that was created or someone connected somebody to somebody else. Um, and so I think that's really important. But I think, I mean, I've mentored or coached colleagues who wanted a, a more assertive voice at the table. And what I, what I would do is use examples. How did I handle the situation where I asked and I got it? And how did I not ask and what, what was happened as a result? Mm -hmm. I'll give one personal example. Um, you know, I had my first child in, you know, right before I turned 30. I was out on maternity leave. And the job, the next job, opened while I was out. And no one called me. No one was, you know, even though I probably was on the succession plan, no one came looking for me. Out of sight, out of out mind. Out of sight, out of mind. And I'm like, I haven't heard from anybody. I'm going to give a call. Like, that's, that's what I want. I want that job. Yeah. And I called, and it was like, you do? Why would you want that now? I mean, you just, I'm like, 
I want, I want to raise my hand, I want to put myself through the process. If it means I have to come back early, I'll come back early. And went through the process and got that role. But I can tell you, if I hadn't called and I hadn't advocated for myself, there was no, my manager wasn't even, and he was the same manager, from the, didn't advocate for me. So I think you have to build your own confidence. Um, and I think as people, the best thing we can do for each other, no matter what level you're at or what job you want, is to share examples. Because I think that gives people the inspiration or the confidence to try to advocate for themselves. But there's a lot of times I didn't, so. I, I, I think to answer your question directly, I think for some of, I'm an introvert, give me a book and my dog and a pillow and I'm happy, right? <laughs> but you've got me on a stage in front of all these people because we've, I've had to learn to sort of put that sort of natural bias to this the side. This is a dog friendly conference. I hope you could so, have, uh... I hope so. <laughs> and so the, the, to answer your question, I think even if we are not naturally inclined to ask and advocate for ourselves, we can, we, we, can, we can learn, which is why mentorship is important, which is why sponsorship is important. Another strand of the sponsorship sort of discussion, when I think about what it means to be a good leader from a DEI perspective, is creating opportunities for people who work with you, junior people in particular, creating opportunities for them to make mistakes and to be comfortable with making uh. mistakes, right? And so I'm building this claims team, I'm building a claims system. We have, ro we have, we have what do they call them? guardrails in the system, right? And so I can have a junior claims person get involved with the claim, put a financial limit on it, right? So she's, he or she is not gonna bankrupt the company if they make a mistake. Um, <laughs> but they have the ability to, to fail if they need to. And what I was taught is fail fast, fail forward, right? Mm. And they have not only that, but also my commitment to them that I'm not gonna get upset if they make a mistake or if they ask a question. Um, and so that I think is key to run in parallel with sponsorship as well. I love that. I, love, I think the only thing I'll also add is, uh, you know, wearing my talent hat and, you know, the fact that I focused on careers. I, I do think we've got to encourage people to do hard things. You're mm. not going to, it's not fatal. Um, I think it was Church, Churchill's, uh, you know, I think sometimes people think that it will just come in measured ways or easier ways, but really any success takes tenacity, it's tough. Mm. Go to another country, go to another jurisdiction, uh, put yourself in spaces where yes, you are uncomfortable, because I do think that level of discomfort builds the resilience. So we talked about business resiliency, but there's a career resiliency that you gain when you push towards what's hard. In an insurance company, in a Bermuda market, yeah, because it thins out at the top, it's harder for women. It's harder for people that are racially diverse or any, any kind of difference. But I, 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 so I want that to get better in terms of the experience because people shouldn't have to feel mentally stressed to work for a company. Mm. But I think also we need to encourage uh, talent to really also consider a couple of hard things as part of your career development. These issues we've just been talking about now in terms of knowledge sharing, allowing people to make mistakes, putting challenges in front of people. This all has to be quite different in the work from home environment, right? I don't know what your companies are like, or you're, you're a sole proprietor, so it's different, but you have experience in a large organization. How, how uh, can we make the same connections, offer younger people the same challenges when, as you said, we're talking over a screen or we're on the phone or we're doing a Zoom call. Are there specific challenges we need to be thinking about, specific solutions? Or is it just get into the office? No, no, <laughs> look, look, I mean, you want, my personal view is, you know, the being out of the, you know, COVID and the, the last few years and where all the different companies are relative to coming back, not coming back, hybrid, whatever. You know, I think it's been a derailer in attracting new talent to our industry. I think it's been, you know, many people say it's been a derailer for caregivers, you know, of young children, elderly parents. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think it did move the needle in a pretty progressive way to a very traditional industry that would never have let people work from home. Yeah. I mean, never in my career have I been able to be part-time or was I given any option to work at home. So, you know, as much as it, had some steps back, I think, in some ways, depending on the company, depending on the location and geography. I do feel that 
you know, making time in the office together as collaboration time, training time, you know, sh sharing information time, like purposeful. Um, you know, you still, and I'm actually an introvert too, which most people never believed, but um, it allows you to have your headspace and your time, and mm. if that's the way you like to work, but then you do get the benefits so you don't miss the opportunities that might create, be created. I mean, you know, I think everybody lost something during that period. You know, kids that were in school, um, kids that were in college, all of those, I mean, there was a lot of missed training moments, missed opportunities. But I think what as I think as leaders, it's about adaptability and versatility. So when I think about you know recruitment now, or I think about how do I get the most how do I get the most out of each person on the team who likes to operate differently, has a different style of personality, it's just thinking through how do I give them what they need and what's the best environment that makes them operate at their best. And for each person, that's slightly different, and then you try to adapt that to a flexible environment. But I think it's going to be interesting to see five, ten years from now, did internal promotions happen? Do people feel, do we have a, a gap in, in time of skills that didn't get transferred or trained? I don't think we fully know the implications yet. But I think you do have to be a much more versatile leader and a mm. versatile employee to ask more often if you're the one on the screen when the team happens to be more in the office or not. And there should not be any discrimination, in my opinion, for that flexibility. Um, We're not going back. No. I'm not going back, anyway. You looked a lot more comfortable when we did the prep call. <laughs> just, gonna, just gonna be honest. I, Are you I, right? Right. Yeah. I'm all for the disruption because I think the traditional organization was never designed with women in mind, with racial diversity issues in mind with elder. The traditional organizations as we know them were designed with men in mind. I mean, let's just be honest about it. So COVID gave us a chance to introspect. Is this how we want to live? Is this how we want to work? And I think that I'm very sympathetic to senior leaders that need people in, but I think it gave us a chance to reset the way we work. I think we will find that there are gains. I think businesses are pulling in record profits despite hybrid working. And I think it was a gain for women. Um, I think it was a gain for, you know, the other issue is frankly, racially diverse talent said to us like, oh my God, I don't have to deal with microaggressions, count me in. You know, because being at work can be very stressful depending on who you are. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as white leaders, we probably don't think about that. Like for somebody, the racial stress wasn't worth it. The commutes weren't worth it for some people in the US. So I think it allowed us to challenge the status quo in a way, hopefully, that will allow the workforce and the workplace and environment to be better for everyone. So I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I like the office, right? <laughs> And I advocate the office, though we are flexible for obvious reasons. I think it's important to be flexible because we've learned, one, we can work remotely um, and still be productive and the company can still be profitable. But at the same time, I think there is something very important around having people together in proximity to create culture, to manage culture. And then I, and I, from a DEI perspective, one of the saving graces for companies is having a good culture. When our underwriters in the EPLI space or the ENO space go out and meet with their clients, one of the first and foremost questions is around the culture and wanting to understand the culture and wanting to understand how culture um, is shared amongst offices and from a claims perspective, um, particularly in the EPLI space, what we found is that while, particularly for global companies, home office and offices near home office can share a really good solid culture such that the litigation liability is managed effectively when we talk about the more remote offices where the cultural message has not traveled as effectively, there are problems. And so from a practical perspective, if you've got a, a, a company domiciled in London or, or New York, the US, the, the, the provincial sort of U UK offices probably won't have the same issues that Hong Kong or Singapore will have just because of the way that the culture has not traveled um, that geographic distance. I, this is a good time for me to remind you that the sponsor of this conference is a set of independent partnerships all over the world. So they have a uh, issue, you know, they, they, they all understand that issue well. I, I want to touch on something you said, Chen, which is 
this is a risk industry. So I, I think you, you started to do it there, but I want to think about that more, thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion issues in terms of risk companies, how an, an inclusive or not inclusive workplace changes the way you think about risk in a, in a business where you're measuring and buying risk is the business. Do you, do you, do you have thoughts on that, Chen? Well, I have a few, one or two. <laughs> um, look, I think we should embrace DEI because it's the right thing to do. There's a moral imperative. There is also a business reason for, it, for embracing it as well. I mentioned the employment practices space. Bermuda is a significant market for EPLI insurance. Mm. Um, you can buy an entire tower of insurance, EPLI insurance, on the island. Since 1996, I think it was when we issued our first EPI, EPLI policy, as a market, we have paid about 1.4 billion in claims for employers who have gotten into issues usually um, because of some sort of discrimination related issue. And so from an insurance perspective, an EPLI perspective, understanding this landscape is important because it's part of our business, it's part of what we do. Um, and it's, we hear a lot about sustainability of the product from a, from a property perspective given, given climate change. We also think about sustainability of the EPLI product, given the, 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 the culture wars that we are all experiencing, the, the landscape that we are a, a, a part of, given, given headwinds that DEI face because of the political landscape and because of misunderstandings, I will say, of the Students for Fair Admissions Supreme Court case recently, right? Mm. Um, and so yeah, from, a, from a risk perspective, there's a, there's a lot to say around DEI. Just to build on that in terms of, yep, you know, our industry is taking, some people are taking risk, right? right? Where we're trying to find solutions to protect from risk. You know, I think, what I think is, there's so many evolving risks. I mean, whoever thought cyber would be a coverage that, I mean, 30 years ago, no one even would have thought what that was. Um, I think the importance of bringing all the different perspectives to a risk decision makes for better decision making and makes for sustainability of our industry. And I think, you know, we have a purpose. You know, when you think about what is the purpose of this industry or that industry, our purpose is to get people back, you know, again, their home put back together or their business back off the ground or, you know, uh, to me there's, there's, you know, that ties right to the importance of what we're talking about in that, if we're purpose-led in what we're doing to our, to our clients, how can we not be more purpose-driven and supportive of the diversity of perspective within our own companies? Mm. Any thoughts? I think they covered it. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I, th I think we're starting a bit to get our arms around some of the big issues here, which, is, which are, uh, doing knowledge transfer or sponsorship that keeps people moving up through the organization, creating an organization where people feel uh, comfortable at work, their values are reflected in their work, where the culture is one where different perspectives are taken in and, and so forth. Uh, what are the barriers to doing a better job? We're not where we need to be, right? We. Uh, I remember talking to a chief executive of a large financial services firm some years ago, and he, I said, you know, when is the C-suite of this company going to look different? And he said, I think of it as like I'm running an airport, and we're landing planes full of executives, one after the other, and the current plane that's landing now is full of white guys. And it's, I'm looking, and it's three or four planes still on schedule before we get there. What's stopping us? What's stopping us from having at the highest level of the insurance industry in Bermuda and elsewhere, the stuff we're talking happen all the way to the C-suite. Well, with that analogy, if, if that, the first plane is the white plane, yeah. what plane am I on? Yeah. Right? So I think the risk is you lose people. Yeah. Because nobody wants to wait, especially if they're really good. Good people have choices, Robert, right? Yeah. If you're really good, you will probably take your bets on yourself and do something else. So I think mm -hmm. the industry needs to be a little bit contemplative that you keep people in the warming the bench, bench for too long. Yeah. And I think women tend to warm the bench a little bit too long. Racially diverse people tend to warm the bench for too long. 
But to flip to solutions, and I think Chen started with this, is our companies should be focused on measuring and tracking their data. I think you were a very data-driven business, so we should have a strong command on what does the workforce look like at the entry level, mid level, and the senior level. And because we count women, right, and men, we can count racial diversity, you should be able to look at those metrics and govern those over time. And, and I think it will show you where you have the chalk points. But, you know, you know go just governance of data should not be left to, you know, the discretion of a, a manager of an individual. Talent discussions should actually not be had unless you're looking at your data. So data is one piece. And then I think you have to care about the experience. I do worry about the experience of women at the senior level personally, because I think they're still under a lot of duress. I worry about the experience of racially diverse talent. So you have to track the data, but I think you also have to focus on the actual experience because you want people to feel like they could actually thrive in the organization. And your feeling is in the industry, people aren't taking the numbers seriously, not looking at the numbers. I not think the association of uh, corporate racial inequity is trying now to push transparency around that data. I think my challenge to all of you attending, is your company participating in that survey? If they're not participating, why not? Because I think the, the, the individuals that are really trying to govern that data are really trying to do one for, it, it's a good deed for the entire island. At our, at our company, at the FT, we know what the gender pay gap is, for example. It's a number that just comes up in the office. Measure. I totally agree with everything you said. What gets measured gets done. Right. Yeah, but let's yeah. reflect back a number of years ago where we didn't measure it. Yeah. It was the same white plane, the white plane with the white males coming through. Yeah. It wasn't until we were forced to, forced yeah. by quotas in some countries or places or UK measure, measures gender pay gap or other countries do, do their other things. It wasn't until we were sort of forced to face the music, right. to be fair. Um, so I think that unconscious bias of surrounding ourselves by people that look, feel, operate, act like so ourselves. So you're saying that by, I ban this by saying, you know, one of the barriers, opinion. it's a psychological barrier in a way. And, and you we were forced because, because we had to start measuring it. And so, I think now we're making progress, but if we are honest with ourselves, we got we So got that's answer no so measure. Maybe the solution then is that we, because in addition to being an introvert, if I don't see something, it doesn't exist. Maybe we need to adopt the UK approach and to start having aspirational targets, right? And say, for Bermuda, given the, the, demographic, the demographics of Bermuda and given what we understand to be the demographics of this industry, maybe we need to start having aspirational targets about people of color, women, people with disabilities or neurodiversity in order to focus our minds on what the runway is, right? I, 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 I think one of the... One of the impediments to progress for me is fatigue. And fatigue, I think, is driven by this notion that nothing is getting done. We keep, we keep speaking and talking about the same positive message, but we do not see progress, which is where the data comes in. And I think if we, if we conceptualize that this is where we need to be and we have the data that tracks our progress, I think, from my perspective, I'm less likely to get fatigued. I'm more likely to keep up with the work. Yeah, and that echoes with what you said uh, about <clears throat> people sitting on the bench too long, right? Every company is structured where there's a reward in the future, right? And if you don't see your path to that point, you give up, you get tired. Yeah. And I think there's, a, there's actually a study out there that says men are mostly promoted on potential and women and people of color are often promoted on performance. So I have to have done like 20 things yeah. before somebody says, oh, I think you're worth it. Whereas you, Robert, somebody just looks at you and says, you know what, I think he could run the Dion no book. Story of my life. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, and it comes back to the risk taking. I think taking some risks on talent that doesn't look like you and really taking a chance on people to give them an opportunity and, and being behind them to back them through that opportunity. Uh, I want to just interject into this measurement of productivity because what you said, right? How, like, how is this an industry where you can measure people's productivity? 
So you can say, are the people who are most productive being rewarded in the right ways? You know, is that, and, and are we fit? So, you know, potential is a way of saying we're giving this guy the job even though he's not very productive. I want to clarify my yeah, point, yeah. right? Because it's a numbers business. Yeah. You, you cannot fudge your performance in yeah. insurance. Yeah. You're either growing the book or the book is static or you're shedding the book. Yeah. Like the numbers will reveal you. Yes. I think I'm talking about talent that is already merit based. Yeah. They are all, we are talking about Anne and Chen They're good. and Robert. They're you're good. all good. Now, the business leader then has to say, who am I going to take a chance on, Anne, Chen, or Robert? So it is merit-based. I'm not talking about trying to give somebody a, an opportunity that's not deserved. All productive. That's exactly right. right. So I, I would, someone has to be there's not, it's a pyramid structure. There's not as many seats as you go up, right? I would caution, though, when we speak about productivity, I think there's, and we get into discussion with AI, right? Um, Measuring productivity, I think, is great, but I think we need to have sensitivities around it because although I think our, our discussions right now are pretty much um, driven by race, sex, gender, and, and things that we can see, neurodiversity and disability are things that we cannot see, yeah. and they are things that sometimes are not accurately and appropriately captured when we look at productivity. So if we are sensitive around that, I think, yeah, we can have a conversation around productivity. We have to think about, well, at least when I think about you know, performance, productivity, all these things that you can see or not see. It's, it's not just the what, it's the how. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes, brings us all the way back to the culture and the importance of voices and, you know, everything being, you know, people having the ability to speak up and have a different opinion or share their view and bring their whole self to work. Because you can take all the statistics that you want, but to your point, you don't, sometimes you won't know. And I think through some of these employee resource groups and a lot of companies who have DEI councils and everything else that are employee-led, they're not HR-led. I think that's critically important mm. um, because that's where, I mean, I happen to have the privilege of chairing the women's ERG at, at Axis. I mean, topics have come up that have never, you would never think people would talk about at the workplace, but they're important to people and they're derailing their ability to be successful or effective. And if you don't talk about it, you don't know. I'm, I really want to emphasize that point you just made, though, that this has to be something that is not restricted to the HR department. This is, I think, a mistake a lot of companies make. But we just have a, a little less than three minutes left, and I want to leave on uh, a note of optimism. So let's talk about reasons to be optimistic. We've talked about some reasons to be pessimistic. Uh, What's working? What's getting better? You know, what, what, where, where, what is the light at the end of this tunnel? I mean, I am the eternal optimist on this subject because um, I fundamentally believe that this insurance industry is a dynamic place to work. It has a lot of relevancy, complexity. I mean, it doesn't have the sexy image of every industry, but I, it's really an amazing place to, I think, do business. Um, you know, we heard from Kevin and Ola, like doubling down on their commitment to Bermuda. I, I mean, I think that makes me optimistic. Like we know Bermuda is punching above its weight. So Bermuda is really can be almost a bit of a, a, a world leader in showing that you can have a very diverse workforce and you can actually make that happen. And then the thing that also makes me optimistic is the incoming generation. I mean, I'm a mother, I have, you know, millennials and a Gen Z at home. So, you know, I love the fact that they are fusing us with new energy, new perspectives, new ways of working. So that keeps me optimistic. I, like to be, I am an optimist. I like to be optimistic. I, I, and I think I'm optimistic because outside of this room, the discussions we have around DEI are sort of discussions that are homegrown. Um, and they're not discussions that are being imposed on us, and I think that's important for sustainability of our DEI initiatives. Um, and, and I think while there is a lot of progress to be made, um, I first came into the industry in the early 2000s, and it's vastly different than it was in my short lifetime. That gives me hope and optimism. Last word. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I am optimistic as well, and I'm optimistic because the pace of change um, is going to enable greater innovation, um, greater skills development, and I think it's going to make this industry sexier. Um, we know we're important, but I think, you know, we have no reason not to be. I know the world's a scary place, and there's a lot of things going on that are, you know, deeply upsetting, 
um, and, and that many people are facing as, as a community, as an individual, um, et cetera. But I think this is our opportunity then um, to show what we're capable of, show the progress that we're making, um, and continue to support one another. Because you know, one, one person, one company isn't going to solve this. You know, I think as a community of industry professionals, I think we've got a great opportunity. Tim and Ivy, this is great. Thank Thanks you. very much.